What is up everyone? So as the title of this video suggests, we're going to be talking about bond energy. Simply put, bond energy is the energy required to break a chemical bond in the gas phase. Back when we were discussing thermochemistry, and more specifically in my video called Standard Enthalpy of Reaction, we learned how to calculate the standard enthalpy change, or the amount of heat absorbed or released by that chemical reaction under standard conditions, using the standard enthalpies of formation for the reactants and products, which can be found in the appendix of your chemistry textbook. By the way, if you're interested in brushing up on your thermochemistry, I've included links to both my standard enthalpy of reaction video and my thermochemistry playlist right down there in the description. What if we wanted to find the enthalpy change for a chemical reaction in which one or more of the reactants or products does not have a standard enthalpy of formation that's tabulated in a chemistry textbook? Are we screwed at that point? Should we, should we just pack up and take the walk of shame all the way home with our heads held low? No. No, we shouldn't, because we can use bond energy. So as I mentioned earlier, bond energy is the energy required to break a chemical bond in the gas phase. In chemistry textbooks, bond energies are most commonly reported on a molar basis. For instance, the bond energy of a hydrogen-hydrogen bond is 436 kilojoules per mole. In other words, it takes 436 kilojoules to break one mole of, or 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, hydrogen-hydrogen bonds. Bond energy is a direct indicator of how strong or weak a chemical bond is. You can think of bond energy like the energy required to pull a plant out of the ground. Pulling a dandelion out of the ground in my backyard is nearly effortless and requires a very, very small amount of energy. Pulling a tree stump out of my backyard, on the other hand, is very, very difficult and requires a lot of energy. Frankly, more energy than I'm capable of exerting. In this analogy, the bond between the dandelion and the ground would have a very low bond energy. And conversely, the bond between the tree stump and the ground would have a very high bond energy. The higher the bond energy, the stronger the bond. If we take another look at that hydrogen-hydrogen bond with its 436 kilojoules per mole and compare it to, say, a nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond, which has a bond energy of 946 kilojoules per mole, we can comfortably draw the conclusion that a nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond is stronger than a hydrogen-hydrogen bond. And this helps to explain why hydrogen is quite reactive while nitrogen is very unreactive. Try observing the difference between lighting a hydrogen-filled balloon on fire versus lighting a nitrogen-filled balloon on fire and you'll probably get the point. It's important to note at this point that the bond energy of a chemical bond between a given pair of atoms differs slightly depending on the molecule in which the atoms reside. For instance, let's take a look at molecules of chloroform, bromoform, and fluoroform. All three of these molecules have a carbon-hydrogen bond, but the bond energies of the carbon-hydrogen bond in chloroform, bromoform, and fluoroform are 401, 402, and 446 kilojoules per mole, respectively. Because of this variability, chemists have found it useful to calculate the average bond energy for a bunch of chemical bonds, which is obtained by averaging together the individual bond energies for that chemical bond across a wide variety of compounds. Somewhere in your chemistry textbook, there's a table that looks something like this, which shows the average bond energies for a multitude of chemical bonds. There are two very important observations that we can make by studying this table. One of them is that triple bonds have higher bond energies and are therefore stronger than double bonds, which are stronger than single bonds. For instance, the average bond energies of a carbon-carbon triple bond, a carbon-carbon double bond, and a carbon-carbon single bond are 837, 611, and 347 kilojoules per mole, respectively. The other important observation that we can make from this table is that every single one of these bond energies are positive. None of them are negative. Why do you suppose this is the case? At this point in the video, I would sincerely invite you to pause the video and think on this one for a second. Why do you suppose that every single one of these bond energies are positive and that none of them are negative? Okay, so hopefully you've given it some thought. 
Bond energies are always positive because atoms lower their potential energy by forming a chemical bond. I mean, that's why bonds form in the first place. It's because bonding lowers the potential energy of the atoms, and nature tends to proceed in a direction that minimizes potential energy whenever possible. To break an existing chemical bond is to convert a system of lower potential energy to a system of higher potential energy, and it will always require an input of energy into that system to accomplish that. In other words, the breakage of chemical bonds is endothermic. It requires energy. On the flip side, the formation of a chemical bond releases energy, and it's exothermic. So again, you have bond breakage, requires energy, endothermic, positive. Bond formation releases energy, exothermic, negative. There's a lot of thermochemistry jargon wrapped up in that, so it's important to have a solid understanding of thermochemistry going into this. Keeping those principles in mind, we're in a pretty good position now where we can estimate the enthalpy change associated with a chemical reaction whose reactants and or products do not have tabulated standard enthalpies of formation. Let's take a look at this balanced chemical equation in which one mole of nitrogen reacts with three moles of hydrogen to produce two moles of ammonia, NH3. Yeah, that's the stuff that's used in glass cleaning products that gives a nice streak-free shine. To calculate the enthalpy change associated with this reaction using average bond energies, we need to know which chemical bonds are broken and which bonds are formed, so it's helpful to draw the Lewis dot structures for the reactants and products. By the way, if you're not rock solid on drawing a Lewis dot structure when you're given a chemical formula, please feel free to check out my video entitled Lewis dot structure from chemical formula, the link is right down there in the description. To keep this video as brief and as relevant to bond energy as possible, I'm going to skip the step in which we draw the Lewis dot structures and just show them right now. To figure out which bonds are broken, all we need to do is to observe which bonds are present in the reactants and absent in the products. Since the nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond is on the left-hand side of the equation, but nowhere to be found on the right-hand side of the equation, the nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond is broken in this reaction. Referring to the table of average bond energies gives us a value of 946 kilojoules per mole associated with breaking that nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond. Taking the same approach with the hydrogen-hydrogen single bond that is broken in this reaction gives a value of 436 kilojoules per mole. However, it's important to point out that there are three moles of H2 in this equation not one, as indicated by the coefficient of three in front of that H2. So we need to multiply the bond energy of the hydrogen-hydrogen bond by three, which gives us 1,308 kilojoules per mole. Adding together the energy associated with breaking the nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond and the three hydrogen-hydrogen single bonds gives us a value of 2,254 kilojoules per mole. And again, this represents the amount of energy added to the system in order to break the bonds, so it's positive. If we turn our attention to the right-hand side of the equation, we see that there are three hydrogen-nitrogen bonds in ammonia. Referring once again to the average bond energy table, we see that the hydrogen-nitrogen bond has an average bond energy of 389 kilojoules per mole. Since there are three hydrogen-nitrogen bonds in ammonia, we need to multiply this value by three in order to get the bond energy associated with one mole of ammonia, which comes out to 1,167 kilojoules per mole. But once again, we need to account for the fact that there are two moles of ammonia produced by this reaction, as indicated by the coefficient of two in front of that NH3. Multiplying the 1,167 kilojoules per mole by 2 gives 2,334 kilojoules per mole. In other words, since there are six hydrogen-nitrogen bonds in two molecules of ammonia, the average bond energy of a hydrogen-nitrogen bond needs to be multiplied by 6 in order to represent the bond energy associated with forming two moles of ammonia. And again, this represents the amount of energy released when six hydrogen-nitrogen bonds are formed. So this value of 2,334 kilojoules per mole needs to carry a negative sign. Remember, bond formation is exothermic. So if we take the 2,254 kilojoules per mole absorbed by this system due to the breaking of bonds and subtract away the 2,334 kilojoules per mole released by this system due to the formation of bonds, we get an enthalpy change of negative 80 kilojoules per mole for this reaction. So this reaction is exothermic, it releases energy. And from a bond energy standpoint, all this means is that the amount of energy released due to the formation of chemical bonds in the products was greater than the total amount of energy absorbed by the reaction due to 
breaking of chemical bonds in the reactants. For those of you who like to follow a formula, the formula shown here can be used to calculate delta H for a reaction using average bond energies. Basically this formula is just saying what we already discussed, which is that the enthalpy change for the reaction is going to be the sum of the average bond energies for all of the bonds that are broken, combined with the sum of the average bond energies for all of the bonds that are formed. Taking into account, of course, that the energies associated with bond breakage are always positive, and that energies associated with bond formation are always negative. There's one more thing that I wanted to point out before we wrap it up, and that is that you've probably heard about energy being stored in chemical bonds or energy being stored within molecules. If you've taken a biology class, for instance, you've probably heard that energy is stored in the molecules of adenosine triphosphate or ATP and that these molecules store energy that becomes available to drive biochemical processes. This type of phrasing is rather unfortunate because it seems to imply that if we break a chemical bond in a so-called energy-rich molecule, that it's going to release some energy for us. And that's actually not true at all. I mean, earlier on in this video, we established that bond breakage does not release energy. It only consumes energy. It requires energy. What scientists mean when they say that energy is stored within chemical bonds or stored within molecules is that those molecules are likely to undergo chemical reactions in which weak chemical bonds are broken and strong chemical bonds with high bond energies are formed, which overall releases energy. So it's not the breakage of the chemical bond in the molecule that releases energy, but rather it's the formation of the bonds in the products of the reactions that those molecules undergo. That is all for now. Thank you so, so, so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Please feel free to smack that like button if you think it's well-deserved. And please don't forget to subscribe, turn those notifications on so that you'll be notified the instant my next educational video is uploaded. And most importantly, please leave me your feedback in the form of a comment. I need to be able to get better at what I'm doing. So I invite you to be as brutally honest with me as you want. Thanks again and take care.